Thank you very much. Thank you for coming here. Super glad to be here. Oh, I like that happiness. Uh, yes, my name is Felipe Hoffa. Um, I've been working in the United States for the se last seven years. I'm a developer advocate. For the last five years, previously I, got, I joined Google as a software engineer. Previously I was living in Chile. Previously, before I was born, my grandfather moved to Chile. He used to be a German when he was alive. So at least I'm happy to be back in Germany presenting and meeting all of you. Um, as a developer advocate, I go around the world. I do presentations. I show what tools we have. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out either here, later, or on the social networks. Um, excuse me for being a little late. Last night when I look at the map, um, it said that it, it was going to take 20 minutes to get here, and that was cool, but before arriving, it uh, turns out during the day that takes way longer. Now, why am I showing this in a talk about preserving privacy in, in data sets? Because uh, in this day and age, we have the beauty of being able to use data to do these kind of things. We can know if there are accidents on the road. We can know if there are better ways of reaching the places we want to go. And that's thanks to being able to collect data, anonymize it, and put it to good use. Um, I love giving uh, examples, uh, real time examples of uh, running queries, for example, of how to do this. But we cannot, no one can do this in real time unless you have all of the data that Google has. But you could do similar things with public data. Uh, for example, this is New York. New York, as seen by the tax, uh, 170 million taxi rides during a year that they publish as public data. And you can do, use this data to do interesting things, like I cannot know what's happening in New York in real time, but I can use it to predict from how long it will take to get from any point to any other point at any time uh, during the day, during the night, like uh, this. So with a query like this, I can extract data and I can start visualizing how the city moves in a different way during weekdays, during, during the night, during the day. I can, and we can start solving problems. Like this is the demands of taxis hour per hour. And you might not notice here, but there might be a problem. Let me show you with a live query. So for example, with this query, um, here I'm going over all the 2015 trips. I'm extracting the hour where the taxi trip happened, and I'm counting the number of taxi rides. Uh, this is BigQuery. I'm going to show you a little more about BigQuery later. Um, let me visualize this data. Has uh, anyone here knows BigQuery? Good, good. So you love this. Uh, I'm glad that you already know this tool. I can easily export to a spreadsheet, and then I can ask Google Sheets to visualize data. Mm -mm -mm. Tell, come on. Ah, here you are. I don't know if you have seen this chart before, but uh, you can see that everyone goes to sleep at 5 a.m. New York. This is when you have the least number of taxi rides, and then everyone wakes up and everyone starts going to the office, the demand starts going up, and suddenly at 5 p.m. the demand goes low, and then at peak time when everyone wants to go home, um, these uh, people start riding taxis again. Now, do you know why this happens? Why everyone stops riding taxis at this time? Any guess? Hmm? Traffic jams, that's one. Yeah, but there are worse traffic jams at this hour. Data collection, data. data collection algorithms, that's always, that can fail, but that's not the problem. End of hmm? End of taxi yes, uh, regulations. Um, so basically, the law in New York says that no taxi driver should be more than 12 hours behind a taxi car. And somehow, they trans uh, the taxi drivers translate that rule, no more than 12 hours, to let's shift, uh, let's change our shifts at 5 p.m. 
So at 5 p.m., everyone goes home, and the next taxi driver takes the car, and they go back to the road, and then you people that need taxis cannot find them. So this is not a demand problem, this is an offer problem. And a lot of people are trying to find how to fix this. And the, the cause is regulation. The question is, how do you solve this with regulation? Again, how do you solve it with incentives? So people are looking at the public data and are trying to figure out um, what are the incentives for each taxi driver. Um, now, if we compare, let's compare it with um, Uber or other uh, vehicles for hire, for hire vehicles. This is 2015. You can see on the red line that there were less Uber rides, Lyft rides than taxi cars, but at least there was no gap at 5 p.m. Uh, then in 2016, we had the same amount of taxi rides and for higher drives. But early in the morning when people are leaving home, yes, they're taking more Ubers. And then at 5 p.m. when you really need a car, at least you can find an Uber, but you cannot find a regular taxi. And then if you jump to, to last year, yes, all these uh, new generation technologies uh, of driving are really getting more rides than normal taxi cars. Um, Part of why is because they're there when you need them. They, can, they go to your home, and they're there at 5 p.m. And meanwhile, the regulation still has ev every taxi car driver going home at 5 p.m. Um, this is my motivation to speak about open data. I love open data to use it to solve these problems. But on the other hand, we need to care about the privacy, the privacy of drivers, the privacy of passengers. Uh, we want innovation, but we want protection. And finding the line is not easy. Uh, one solution is just to close everything, let's stop sharing data. But hopefully the solution is not there. Uh, there is a line, there is a meaningful balance that you can reach uh, between having all of the IDs of every taxi driver, de-identifying your data sets, aggregating the, your population, using uh, fake data, or just deleting everything. Where is the balance? Um, I'm not the one that can decide that. If you uh, want to ask this question, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, a lawyer will tell you where your balance is. But at least I can show you some ideas, I can show you some tools, I can show you how we do this kind of thing at Google, at least on the technical side. I work at Google. We do have a lot of data. We have products with more than a billion users, uh, Google Search, Android, Maps, as I showed you, Gmail, uh, the Play Store, YouTube, Chrome. And we have a lot of data here. Some of it we're, some of it we're sharing, but we want, when we share data, we try to preserve privacy as much as possible. Uh, sometimes we don't share data for the same reason. But it's not only within third parties. It's not only open data. Uh -huh. Could you understand everything that I said previously? Thank you. That makes me feel better. Um, so w we share data, but we need to preserve privacy too. But we need to make this data useful. Um, with this, we try also to make our tools available to everyone. So now we have this API, the Google Data Loss Prevention API, which we use internally, and you can also use too. As a developer advocate, when I saw this tool, I became very, very excited about it because I love data, I love public data, so I started learning all of I could learn about it, and now I'm here to share what I know, uh, to get your questions, to bring them back to the team. So please feel free to ask me questions and judge what I'm going to show you here. Uh, I also love talking about BigQuery, who you might also, you have also seen work here. Uh, it's really good to analyze lots of data. You can put giant public data sets there, and you can also put your own private data. And you can, and, uh, two features that are really cool is that you can share data. So all of these taxi rides, the billion taxi rides are there, uh, ready to be analyzed by everyone, and everyone has a free terabyte every month to run queries like the ones I'm running here. So let's talk a little bit about sensitive data and security. Uh, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> yes, it's a credit card. And this is a demo we can do now, like uh, part 
something that is really awesome from our API is that you can feed it pictures, and it will find sensitive data in your pictures and mask it if you need to mask it, identify it, replace it. Uh, because private data is not only in neat tables, in neat columns, it can also live in documents, it can live in pictures, and you want to find it there, and you want to uh, do something about it before sharing it with others. Um, so with this API, you can do classification, find the PII, do transformations, depending on how would you like to transform it, and also do re-identification risk, which I'm going to spend uh, most of the time of this talk at. Uh, there's a lot of sensitive data. There's, there's my PII, my name, my ID. Uh, but there's also data like that's uh, very personal, like financial information, my health data. Uh, data lives in different formats, pictures even. And there are many sources, uh, data that I collect from my users, data that I have from my employees, and data that I also share with partners. Even if you're not doing public data, you still are sharing data with your employees, with partners, and you want to reduce your user's risk, especially in this day and age. Um, just a little bit about the identification. For example, if you are, have a chatbot and you're processing messages like this, before having someone else look at them inside your company, you might want to find the names. Uh, find the name of the person, find the name of the doctor, find their, their ID number, find their phone, and maybe replace it yes, with tokens, first name, or re encrypt the social security number so someone else can de-decrypt it later, or just store the first three numbers, or the fourth the, the last four numbers of their telephone number. You can choose what to do, but at least um, you should be able to decide what you want to find this and decide what's the best strategy. Same thing, um, you have your data in tables, you have your data in comments, uh, you can scan your tables at large scale, large scale. In this case, we're doing it only one, with one message. We can do this in real time. But if you have a table, you can do this too. Um, and then you want to measure the re-identification risk. And, uh, for example, in this case, I have data for four software engineers. If I just put the title in a table, then I'm protecting privacy, because there's a lot of software engineers. But if I have the title of the CEO, there's only one of Google. Uh, so maybe I'm sharing too much. Now you can see everything I know about him. So in each data set, we have people that are more at risk and we have to go and find the outliers and uh, at least have a notion of, of that we have these outliers. Let me show you some details. For example, you have identifiers like the full name, the government ID, but there are also quasi-identifiers. This, you usually feel it's safe to share, but maybe it's not safe to share, like the zip code, the age, and there's uh, sensitive data that you may not want shared about you, even if we remove your name, even if you remove your ID, uh, the quasi-identifiers can, can signify a risk here. And there are measures to you do this, K-anonymity, L-diversity, K-map, Delta presence. Usually, most researchers stop at K-anonymity that I'm going to explain next. And I'm going to use a real data set here. Um, Mexico publishes every uh, child that is born ends up in a database, so you can find a lot of data useful for um, health practitioners. So between 2008 and 2013, they saw about 13 million babies. And we can find where they were born, the, what they, the gender, the weight, the height, uh, health conditions. And you can also learn a lot about their mothers because what, who your baby is and their health depends on the mother's education, the mother's civil status, uh, how, what's her health status, etc. And I have this table in BigQuery. So if, let me show you this table here. It's in Mexico. I have here my birth, nacimientos, because this is a Mexican database, it's all in Spanish, and I have a lot of columns that I can use that are pretty useful. And the first step when working with public data, we want to identify things, we want to do some transformations. 
And we happen to have some tools like Data Prep. Data Prep is an online tool that you can use to uh, visualize your data, transform it. So here I can see that where the mother was born, but most were born in the capital state. Mexico has 32 states with municipality, the birth date of the mother, uh, was she married or not? You can see how the, 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 you can start cleaning it up. Uh, in fact, I did some cleanup here. I translated some columns so you would understand the analysis I'm going to do next. Um, this is just your first step. Visualize your data, uh, transform it, clean up. For example, here when they don't know the height, they replace it with a 999. So I rather uh, just delete that data. Ta -da. So I did that. Uh, you can see my recipe here on the right. And whenever I'm ready to run it or, or refine it, I can just run the job. And I end up with my new data set, which is birth. And here I can do analysis like, for example, by the state where the mother was born. Let's look at the average height of these babies. I can group by, of course, the state, order by the average height. And now I can learn something about Mexico. I can see that the smallest babies are born in Yucatan. The tallest babies are born in Sinaloa. I can also look at what are the bigger states. If I ca start counting, I can add the height to see if the height is proportional to the weight. Are these babies fat or thin? So a fat baby is something that is okay, but still uh, you might want to visualize it. And yes, there is a lot of difference in here. Like th this is height, height versus weight, weight in babies, and there's a lot of variation. It's kind of proportional, but these babies are really fat. These babies are very tall, and it is what it is. But health-wise, it's an important thing. Uh, I'm not trying to fat shame the babies. They it's just their weight and height. Um, now, what's the problem with this data? Uh, let's say I know where you were born. You were born in this state, uh, and you are this gender. And it happens that your mother had this education, or she didn't go to school. I, that's a question I can ask you. And maybe your mother was married or not. And that means I can start finding um, people by that data. So if I look. Just, just at those four things, like where the mother was born or where the baby was born, state, uh, the birth, I can look at the education, I can look at the um, uh, gender, and I can look, what was the other column? Gender, weight, and marital status. And I count all of these things, group by one, two, three, four, order by C in descending order. Let's see how many different groups of these four uh, values I have. Uh, yeah, so in Mexico, the capital state, there's a lot of ma male babies that were born with, for mothers with secondary complete uh, uh, education that were not married but in a domestic partnership, and there's 150,000 of these. Good. Uh, this data is kind of protected. If you tell me those four variables, there are 150,000 different babies like that. On the other side of this table, um, if you were born in Tabasco and your mother has a postgraduate and you're a girl or, or a woman and if your mother was separated, then there is only one of those. It means I can go to this database and I can find exactly when was your birth date, what were the conditions we were born, and now your data can be said that it's more at risk. Uh, and we need to make decisions about this. And at least we are able to measure, uh, to measure that this is happening. Uh, in fact, this is what we call the K-anonymity. Uh, in general, researchers like having K-anonymity 5. Instead of having only one person with these uh, four variables, they try to publish data sets where for each group there are at least five people with the same data. How can you fix this? 
you can delete these rows, uh, which might be bad too, because if you delete these rows, then we are losing data from these states. Or if we group data, like for example, if we remove the gender or we remove the location, then we have uh, bigger groups of people, their anonymity is preserved, but we are losing data. And this, this, that's when we need to start making some decisions. Um, so these are the queries I just ran. Uh, turns out, for example, if I delete the groups that are smaller than 50, in Mexico, the bigger state, I'm deleting less than 0.04% uh, of the data. If I delete these groups, but when I delete the same groups, uh, other states, like the smaller state, uh, Baja California, I'm deleting more than 1% of the data. So that kind of um, strategy uh, ends up deleting more data of the smaller states, and you have less representation, which is also bad. Um, now, I just measured K anonymity using a query. Uh, the good news with our API is that we can just uh, we have normalized these things behind an API, so you can just tell it, hey, for this da table, my birth, uh, do K anonymity and look at these four columns, and you will get results and you will get these measures in a standardized way with the API. Um, but then K anonymity is not enough. Uh, a lot of researchers are fine with K anonymity 5, but then you have things like, for example, from Post-graduate divorces in Coahuila de Zaragoza, we have five babies. Okay. The problem is, if we go back to the table, turns out um, these five mothers had hepatitis B. So now we know something about all of these mothers, even if there were five of them, because they all share the same uh, sensitive data. So we, instead of using K-anonymity, we can use a different measure, which is called the L-diversity. With L-diversity, we want to measure, and we are able to fa uh, request that each group also have, each group to have more representation of the sensitive data, so you cannot make any conclusions about it. Now, um, we have these problems because we have a complete data set. If I had a data set of one line of only one person born in Mexico, even if then K anonymity is one, uh, that's not too risky. Let's say I have this. Uh, this is my whole table. I have a table with two rows. Zip code, age, and more sensitive data. K anonymity in this table is one, because I have one of each. Um, there's not much I can do about it. But it's okay, these people's data is secure, private, because uh, there's a lot of uh, 42 years old in this zip code. But it turns out, if you look at this zip code in the census, the first one, 85535, um, the first zip code has a population of only 20 people. So if you have only 20 people there, probably there's only one person with, that's 79 years old. Uh, hence, I'm still revealing a lot about one individual. And we cannot fix that by measuring K anonymity, because K anonymity is not good here. And we added this concept of K map. Uh, how many people live in this location? And for that, you need additional data, data that is not part of the system. You need to look at the census data. And yes, the good news is we can bring that data here. Um, and then, so how do we fix this? Instead of publishing the zip code and the age, we can just publish the zip code. And now the K map is 20, because it could be any one of these 20 people. Is that enough? Uh, not always. Uh, let's see, for example, here, K anonymity is one, K map, uh, we're not sure, because, well, it's one, two, because we need to look at the, how many people live in this zip code. Turns out, in this zip code, we have five people between 10 and 19. So if we want to have a K map of five, then instead of publishing the age, we can publish the age that's between a range. Each of these rows, these people have a range between 10 and 19, and that's how we have a better K map anonymity. 
This still presents a problem for privacy. Oh, this hurts. Um, this still pre uh, presents a problem because um, even if we have a K-map anonymity of five, maybe now we're talking about everyone in this city. Uh, where, uh, for example, your presence in this data set might reveal that you have some kind of health condition. So if everyone is present, that's still a problem. We have a different measure for this, and we call it delta presence. And uh, these measures, uh, especially uh, uh, measures how much you could attack a data set, uh, where your presence makes it dangerous, and you still need the extra data that the census data. So is now instead of publishing that we the the age between 10 and 19, where the delta presence is one, we can change it uh, to a wider range. Uh, these five people, the age is between 10 and 39, and now the delta presence is 0.25 because it could be any one of these other people, anyone between 10 and 39. Um, now, uh, in real data sets, for example, in New York City. New York City, the first time they published the taxi trips, uh, you could find the exact latitude and longitude where everything started, and the hash of the driver, and it turns out some people complained that they didn't want to find out. Th they could easily find out who the driver was. That was not good. So New York removed the hash of the driver. Uh, now you cannot see who the driver is, you cannot follow their adventures. And then in the last release, the most recent ones, you cannot see the latitude and longitude, the exact place where people took the taxi rides. Um, now we have a general zone, which are good measures. Now we're preserving privacy. But on the other side of the balance, uh, with coarser location, we cannot get the best place to catch a cab. Like previously, people were finding out if you want to take a taxi to, from Brooklyn to New York, this is the best place to stand because this is where the taxis are, ca are coming back from the airport and you can catch them. Well, now you cannot do that. If you remove the driver ID, again, you have a new problem. Uh, when you want to find the, the best way to change regulation, to find the best incentives, what make taxi drivers um, not go home at five, now you cannot follow their behavior. You cannot uh, figure out the best regulation. Um, also for privacy, for to get a, low, uh, a higher K map, K diversity, etc., uh, you might want to remove the areas that have the least number of rights, like very remote areas. Uh, you don't want. You may want. Uh, it might be easier to identify you because you are the only one that lives there every day, so people can find your data. So we can remove those rows. But then if we remove those rows, uh, when people use this data for public policy, they will not be considering the most remote areas. So you're leaving them at risk. And then you, you could also do like restricting to trusted partners. Let's not share all of this data with everyone. Let's run a hackathon where we invite our best friends, our, the best researchers, and we can go on and we can share more data with them. Uh, and I've been part of these hackathons. It's been really cool. But the problem is that once you start restricting data to only some people, some people that could really use this data to further policy, to understand what's happening, they don't have access to it. And that's also a big problem. I've, I've been talking with cancer researchers uh, in universities that tell me that they cannot get access to data. It's all kept in the big pharma. They don't have access. And that also limits how much progress we can make uh, fighting cancer. So. Again, finding the right balance is not an easy question, but at least you can measure where to go. Uh, we have these problems too. For example, uh, for a long time, people have asked us to share a uh, sample Google Analytics data set. Everyone here, if you like data, you want to analyze uh, Google a store, any store, their data, how people are behaving. And we want to share that data with you. But before doing this, with, which we actually did finally in March 30 of this year, there were a lot of people celebrating this. Uh, we had to do some de identification. So we removed, for example, the source of the traffic source, uh, of, of the traffic where people were coming from. Uh, we replaced some of the content, the URLs uh, of the pages where people were visiting. Um, and so we, we tried to normalize and begin the group while still preserving some data. Um, 
Now, a little bit about the API in my last 10 minutes. Uh, so, for example, you can use it to, as I was showing you earlier, to mass data. Uh, so, for example, here with the phone numbers, we are keeping only half of them. The job titles, we uh, instead of having it with a lot of detail, we're grouping them by. Uh, the IDs of each employee, we can encrypt in a way that we can decrypt. And even on the comment side, we can find and redact data. Uh, so, yes, you can do the partial masking, you can do encryption, you can do format preserving encryption where the number still looks like a phone number, but it's not the real phone number, and you can bring the data back. And you can do this with calls to the API like this. Um, so here I'm telling the API, use this private key that you should not share unless we, you have a trusted partner. Uh, use a common alphabet, a numeric alphabet, and look at the employee ID field. And that will replace every real ID with a decryptable ID. Now I can decrypt it back with a re-identify operation if I have the key. Same thing, I can ask it to bucket my data. Uh, I can even do some date shifting. Instead of preserving the exact date where things happen, I can move things around. And I can even ask the API to preserve the sequence between uh, the same groupings. Uh, and I can tell the API, for this kind of groups, for this kind of Z, preserve the difference. So at least I can keep a uh, history that makes sense. We can look at data. Like Google can recognize uh, IDs from many countries. So you can automatically use the API to uh, detect and transform private IDs. Or you can even create your own custom uh, regular expressions to find data that is not recognized automatically. And then you can even do some uh, fi uh, find hot works, uh, define what's the likelihood if something is PII or not by the presence of other words around it. And uh, you can just define it with things like that. For k anonymity, if you want to measure it, you just need to tell the API, these are my quasi IDs. Uh, look at these groups. And you can also do some grouping with an entity ID for canonymity. With L diversity, the same. We need our quasi IDs. We tell the API, these are my quasi IDs. But also for L diversity, you need to tell it, these are my sensitive attributes. This is where I want to measure that there is a diversity between the groups. For KMAP, uh, again, you can show your quasi IDs, but you have to make sure to either uh, show that this one of these quasi IDs uh, represents a geolocation, so we can bring uh, census data, uh, or you can bring your own auxiliary tables with more statistics that we can use instead of uh, using one of the publicly available data sets. Same for Delta Presence, it has, uses the same kind of extra data that either Google already knows, like the demographics of countries or zip codes, or you can bring your own uh, auxiliary table. You can do all of this without the API. These are uh, uh, really important concepts that should be used outside, but the API makes it easy. Uh, we have privacy experts working on this. For example, this is Ted on privacy. If you want to follow him on Twitter, he was publishing about KMAP back in February. Uh, his blog posts are now our documentation, or we, we're, we're working together. Uh, back in April, he wrote his first blog post about Delta Presence, and he said, as you can read there, I don't know of any available software that does this for you. Well, it turns out now June 1st is when we launched uh, the Delta Presence measure in the API. So, yeah, we are innovating here as fast as we can. We're bringing the um, uh, wherever we are doing internally, outside, and we're sharing these uh, tools with you. Uh, I try to compare a lot of these dangers of public data with matches. Turns out fire burns people, fire burns houses down, but we still want to live in a world with matches. There is a lot of value on having data, on sharing data, on being able to see what's happening around the world. Um, our task, what we have to do together, is find the right balance through regulation, through best practices, through tools. Um, even if you don't have public data, you're still sharing. Uh, the, you have different class of employees. Uh, most of your coworkers should not get access to most logs. Maybe you can share half of the logs. You can anonymize logs for them. Uh, you can redact, bucketize, remove sample data. 
uh, you can work with permissions, uh, articles, you can do certain views. You should audit how uh, your teammates are using data to make sure that uh, they are acting according to the best practices. And you can also measure the risk of any of these solutions when you're sharing data. Um, also, this is super important for machine learning. Um, people, when, when people are doing machine learning, when they're creating models, the more data they have, the better their models will be. Um, just reducing the resolution still presents these kind of dangers that we showed. Uh, but if you reduce it, also you lose, you have less effective models, you are biasing your models, you are uh, keeping away the most, uh, the, the minorities if you remove them for, to preserve their privacy. And so I was showing you the tools that I showed you today were BigQuery, where you can store a lot of data, share, uh, share either publicly or with strong ACLs with some people, data prep to do interactive data cleaning, DLP to run all of these risk analysis, identify, transform, and with Stackdriver that I didn't go into, you can just, all of these operations get logged and you can audit what people are doing with the data. And if you have any more questions, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me on Reddit, you can find me on Stack Overflow. And if you have feedback for me, please use that link because I love feedback as I keep learning and trying to do a better presentation. Thank you very much. And you can also have questions just now. So any yes. questions? Hello. Hi, nice presentation, gracias. Um, I had a question about definition of sensitive data. Uh -huh. Because it's uh, health financial, which is very US centric. And I saw you had a table with SSNs in different countries, so that's great because for Europe it's like a nightmare. Uh, but sensitive data or special categories of data in Europe is a bit larger than what the US has, so yeah. is there a possibility to make this evolve towards what Europe also considers to be personal? So yes, we have, sense, on one hand we have PII, like uh, identifiers, and we have sensitive data. Um, PII um, identifiers are usually easy to identify, it's either names or how passport looks, like what we have here in this slide is uh, Canada passport, data health, the health insurance code, uh, for spine, the near number, or where is your money, well, etc. Um, and this, we are adding more identifiers while we also give you the possibility of adding it. Now, sensitive data, it's whatever you define to be sensitive data. Um, is your zip code sensitive? Is your. Hmm? Yeah. So it's defined by the legislation, which is one of the problems we have currently is political affiliation, religious beliefs, and things like that. So is that going to be entered inside that? Because um, the US doesn't define sensitive yeah. data. So in, in this case, what we, have as, uh, what we define as sensitive data is whatever we tell the API, these are my sensitive columns. Like, yeah, I can, um, in this definition for the API that I have in my API call, that I have here, ah, yes, for the, when I'm measuring L diversity, on one hand, I hand in it the quasi-IDs, but the quasi-IDs, I'm not calling it sensitive data, I'm calling it your location. But sensitive attributes is whatever columns you say, I find these columns are sensitive, please uh, give me a measure if I have enough diversity or not. But great question. Yeah, and it's a very hard topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, time is over, but if you oh. have more questions, I'm pretty sure that Philip would be... Yes, and there will be another Felipe presenting now. Yeah. <laughs> Today is the Felipe afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The, the, the next presentation also from another Philip. So, thank you again. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh,